All right, hi everyone. Welcome to the Simon Fraser Student Society uh, Surrey Mayoral Candidates Debate. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, Amrit Bairing. Hi, my name is Amrit Bering. I represent People's Council Surrey, and we have five councillors in our team. I am not a career politician. I just entered politics last year. I ran for federal seat in my area. The reason I came into politics is that uh, our government is broken at all levels, federal, provincial, and municipal. Why I say that? Canada is one of the biggest landmass in the world with sparse population, but our house prices have doubled, which has made every middle class job person very poor and hand to mouth. Second, we are oil country, but we are paying oil uh, filling in our gas uh, through our nose. Third thing, food. We have plenty of land, agricultural land, and yet food prices have doubled. All these things have happened because our governments are incompetent. And that's why I jumped into politics because I will provide an honest government. I have intelligence, courage, wisdom to think long term and big picture and to fix these issues. Another big issue is in Canada, we are losing our freedoms very fast. If you look at world, any country who is impoverished, the government is always tyrannically and people do not have rights. It wasn't like that in Canada, but in last four, six years, it's happening here. And uh, this is Charter of Rights and Freedom. Those who read it, it says, there are fundamental freedoms, which is freedom of thought, belief, opinion, and expression. And we are losing it fast. And universities are not doing any, any, any better as well. It's uh, sp free speech is heavily censored in SFU at UBC as well. So this is a slippery, spo slippery slope. When you shut down the freedom of speech, you shut down the freedom of thought. It means you control people. And when you control people, it's not good for anyone. Thank you. You will not hear feel-good statements from me. I claim to speak truth. I believe we do not have as big racism problem as it made out to be. I have many friends from all walks of life. My only criteria is the morality of the person and I go very well along with them. And those who lack that, they don't become my friends. And that's regardless of race or anything. You guys are students here. Do you, do you not have friends from different races? Do you see the racism? The reason we talk about racism in Canada repeatedly, if there's a one incident happens because of someone's individual reasons, Media pumps it whole day. Because media lives on sensationalism, that's how they sell the news. And our government is using these terms repeatedly so they can divide the society. And then they can get individual votes. They tell everyone, we are saving you from each other. So I believe we should open our hearts, not just stay among our one similar race friends, we should open up to everyone, and you will say, see that we are all beautiful people in Canada. Thank you. If you have to tell someone, please vote, please vote, it's your civic duty, it's your obligation, it's your right, that means we have already failed. People will vote with a vengeance if they think something will change. In the last municipal elections, 2018, out of 300,000 Surrey electorates, only 100,000 voted. That's one in three. That's because they do not trust government. They know if four people are there, 
neither is good enough for them to vote. So they have no enthusiasm to vote. So what we need to change is, we need to mo bring more honesty, morality in elections, in the political parties. In the current model, most of the parties get funding from big donors who fund them because they seek favors from them once they get elected. So when they get elected, no matter who, they work for their masters and not for the people. And people can see that, that they promise a lot of things during campaigning, but they do not deliver. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So that's the situation we are in. And that's why I jumped into politics as a fresh person to change that. Thank you. My contention is that the crime in a city is the reflection of the society. A healthy society has very minimum crime, but an unhealthy society where people do not have equal opportunities, people's life is miserable. For example, if they have to pay rent which they cannot afford, they worry about their kids, how they are gonna afford to raise them, how they're gonna afford to buy them things. So everything goes wrong from there. That's when people start blaming each other. They blame other races, media pumps it, biases are created, and it shows up in violence activities, vandalism, etc. So my plan is, if government is honest, they run their budgets judiciously. Instead of favoring special interest groups, they do things that are in interest of the people, provide them employment, education. We can minimize the crime and the hate among different people. Thank you. I arrived in Canada about 25 years ago from India. And since then, government after government comes and says, we will do reconciliation, including Justin Trudeau, who is, who is very big on it, being a drama teacher. But it doesn't get done. You have to ask why. We have a sitting MLA here in power for four years. You have to ask her, why don't they do reconciliation? Why they talk about it? Why don't they actually do it? We have a missing member of parliament who brags he has been in MP five times. You have to ask him, why don't they do it? And a bigger question is, what does reconciliation mean? What should we do that we can say we have done reconciliation. I haven't come across one person in Canada who can tell me, and I challenge these guys, do they know what reconciliation means? So here is the rub. It's a giant fraud. Canadian government has no intention to do reconciliation. Their strategy is to drag on, keep making feel-good statements and drag on. As we speak, the lawyers of the natives and Canadian government are fighting with each other. If they want to do reconciliation, why are they fighting court cases against each other? So that's all I have to say. We need to get real, actually do things. And as a students, you should be asking these questions. Thank you. In a healthy society, we should not have any police. If you think about what is police, it polices us. So they monitor us that we behave well. And most of people do, but some do not. So we bring in police. More miserable a society is, more crime happens, and then we talk about hiring more police to monitor us more. In the olden time, there used to be no police. People used to defend themselves. Although it's not possible in modern society, but we should all take martial arts like Ginny. She, she was a judo, I, 
I would like to see her in action sometime, then talking about past glory. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, first thing, we all need to empower us. That's what I'm getting at, physically, mentally. And we should not say any little threat and call 911 and the cop didn't arrive. Because when we have that mentality, we inherently live in fear. And women more so than men. But men too, there are small men, there are bigger men, there's a hierarchy everywhere. So we need some police, but it should only be for hardened criminals. Rest of the society, in a healthy society, our aim should be to have minimum police. And those who are, they should be obviously fair and show empathy to everyone before dealing with anyone. Thank you. There are two edges for this accessibility. Um, every society would want to build accessibility for everyone, but it comes with a cost. I know many poor countries, there's no such concept. Everyone has to look up for themselves. Older people, they're mostly transported by their kids. Luckily, they're more family culture as well, so it makes up for it. But down here, we are more isolated. So we should be building all facilities, keeping everyone in mind. But the other edge is, it comes with a cost. It increases cost of everything. In a competitive uh, capitalist society, things are done for profit. And, and when the cost increases, it's always passed on to tax paying people. Because remember, government does not make anything, it just consumes. So best thing is, we should have healthy economy, we should have prosperous society, we should have lower taxes so that government can have, so there are more businesses and government has good uh, funding. We need funding and then we can provide more, more facilities to our citizens including accessibilities. But just talking about it, wish list is not gonna do anything because ultimately it comes down to the capital available to government. Thank you. If you go to YouTube and search for Amrit Bering, two videos will show up on housing. Here is the crux. Since 2001, our government decided to sell Canadian housing to foreigners. Anyone sitting abroad can buy a house. They need visa to come to Canada, but they need nothing, just transfer money. So there's a heavy money laundering, mostly from China. We started buying housing in Vancouver and Toronto. And people used to say, Vancouver and Toronto are crazy. Well, guess what? Now Surrey is crazy. Yukon is crazy. Newfoundland Labrador is crazy. Everywhere, people have been proused out of housing market and rental market. This is engineered by all three level of governments because when house prices go up, they raise property tax. So their coffers are filled, government, so they are happy. And their developer friends who fund them, they are happy. And banks, real estate industry, they all are called experts, but they all vested interests. So this problem can never get resolved. We have sitting MLA for four years, MP is missing, and our mayor is missing. They all know the problem, but they do not want to solve it. They just talk about it because just to get elected, anything. So crux is, you are students here, you know the equation. In equation, if you put an unknown variable, the uh, result is unpredictable. So we have an immigration policy where our federal government decide how many new people to take in. But on the same side, they need to figure out where they will live who will provide the medical services and schooling on all kind of government services, but they don't think. Why? We don't know. Because they bring in people to get cheap labor and exploit them, charge four times tuition fee from international students. So they, and they have to work for two jobs to make for it. So this whole thing is going on and our own government is responsible for it. So if we come to governing, we will do the right policies prudent policies and take all side of equation into consideration. Thank you. First of all, I have lived in Surrey for a while and I work in downtown. So every morning I take 
I walk to bus stop, I take bus, go to SkyTrain, in rush time it's full, you have to slam in, and uh, you go to downtown, you walk, and you come back in the evening. So that's my daily routine for 15 years, so probably I know something about transportation. I have also lived in Singapore for three years, two and a half precisely, which is a role model for transportation. Before that, I lived in New Delhi, only 20 million population. So, so uh, in Surrey, it's mostly a housing hub, and it grew and grew and grew. So we have horizontal and vertical roads, and it has come to bottleneck now. So we built this expo train, which came to King George to, uh, in 1986, and hang, hung there for 34 years, until Justin Trudeau was losing majority, so at week before election, he said, we will extend it to Langley. So there is no proactive plan. It's all reactionary. So going by the rest of the cities in the world model, what we need in Surrey is we need a ring of train covering from Guilford to White Rock and border of Langley and Scott Road. We need to think big. We can't build just one train to Newton because everyone talks about Newton. I don't know why. Probably there's a hand laying golden eggs there or what. But uh, we, need a, we need to think big, create a proper infrastructure, fund for it, and do it in step-by-step -step fashion. And at each station, there should be local buses going to local areas. And that's the model I would go for. Only issue is funding. Since federal government is res also responsible for increased population, federal and provincial, they all need to shell out money, including some from Surrey taxpayers. Thank you. Great job, John. There's a phenomena called grand solar maxima and grand solar minima. In this phenomena, every few decades, there's an activity in the sun. Sometimes activity increases, which changes the weather variation very quickly. Sometimes it calms down, and we have relatively calm weather for a long time. This has been around for thousands of years. For example, the lower mainland flood that happened last year, that whole region used to be underwater 100 years ago. We cleared that water, built the dikes, and nature had its wrath, it sent the flood again. There are forces which are doing fear-mongering, using this climate change thing, showing us that misery, evoking our emotions, then using those emotions to push the climate change theory so that they can fund, they are heavily invested in the green technologies. For example, uh, the electric cars. Electric car is the most devastating thing to environment. It has 1,000 kilo of metals in it, which are all extracted from ground. It has things in it which are counted in part per million. Those who took chemistry know Something is called part per million because you have to extract million grains to get one grain of it. So they are heavily against climate and there's no plan to how to recycle them. And moreover, in China, what they do is they use coal to build electricity I'm and then they use electricity Please to charge off. vehicles. So where are we saving the environment? Thank you. I have this bottle about for 10 years. You can see it's rubbed off. And I got it for free. I ran 10K race and at the end they were giving people at random and I won it. So when you drink water from a plastic bottle, let's say you drink five bottles in a day. That's five bottles per day, 365 days in a year. That's about 18, 25 bottles a year. So one person, that's one person footprint, family of four, about 7,200 bottles. 7,000 bottles you are putting in the ocean bed or wherever just because you cannot take a glass to the tap and fill and drink it. In Canada, we are blessed that we have natural water and it's uh, just ready to drink. So there's a disconnect between what we say and what we do, and that's a real problem. The other problem is consumerism. Every two years we have to change our f phone because new phone came up. 
We need to change our car because new models coming up. We need to have 20 pairs of shoes, 20 pairs of dresses, jewelry. It's called consumerism. We do it because commercials show us they are cool. And who shows us? Businesses, because they have to sell us product. This is called economy. So, so that's the crux. If we live simpler life, that is the only way to help climate. Now the very same companies who are selling us green technologies, first they inject fear and then they use that to sell us new product and make more money. So very same people who introduce plastic to us because we used to use paper and plastic. We used to use metal steel, steel glasses. That's how I grew up. Plastic you throw, it's light. It doesn't hurt you. So it was cool at one time, except now it's filling oceans. So now same people are offering us different solutions, which were 20 years down the road, create 10 times more problems, and then they offer us something else. So we need to keep all this in mind. Solution is simpler life, but people don't do that. They want glamour and cool things and newer models. So we need to keep that in mind. Thank you. I lived in Singapore for two and a half years. Just about everyone lives in a condo or government-built multi-story apartments there. Only ultra-rich have single-family home, maybe about 2% of Singapore land. So when I came to Canada, I thought I got rich. I can live in single-family home too with a backyard and trampoline and gardening. But sadly, we are coming to a situation it's going away is it good no do we have choice no when more people coming to city and we ran out of land it's a no-brainer that we need to go high which means townhomes and condos so best we can do not go very high four story six story and definitely don't make it money-making machine from developer's perspective, but think about building whole community around it, as Ginny said in advance, think about school, doctors, parks, so that it's a complete unit in itself, and that's the only solution we have, and that's what we should be doing. Thank you. I work in a software development field. I go to downtown, and uh, right now, a lot of all the US giants, Microsoft, Salesforce, Amazon, they're all moving there. The only limitation is they can't find the office towers. So we have tremendous opportunity in Surrey. If our local government had any imagination, competence, they could transform Surrey to world-class city. So what we need is we need to allocate land for software parks, general small industry, agri-based industry, acquire land, build some natural activities around it to excite youth, build some housing, build some shopping mall. And I say we can easily build a full-fledged university campus in Surrey, like on ground, with all the auditoriums, concert halls, build the whole ecosystem around it, and run a train to airport and downtown from here. So we have tre tremendous opportunity we just need competence, good intentions, and empathy for the public. So if you want this kind of stuff, please vote for People's Council Surrey. My name is Amrit Biring, and I have five councillors with me. Thank you.